I tried so hard to forget you, but I can't. Firebird is based on a true story by Sergei Fetisov. Not many audiences have seen such a true love story based in such a active, rigorous and unexpected environment before. Not only was it shameful and considered almost sickness, but it was also a criminal offence and you would end up with a five-year prison sentence in a hard labour camp. You made my life a disgrace! You made my life a disgrace! A lot of people have said that actually this is very unusual for an Estonian film to be of such size. We shot at about 46 locations across Estonia, plus Moscow and Malta. You think you can just turn up here and drop my life? Our film, when it's over, people are gonna cry. The film was silenced. There were 92 press articles written about how it really is a disservice to the Russian history. And we go, you know, this is a true story. The story found me, which is funny, um, about 10 years ago, the founder of the Black Knights Film Festival here in Estonia, Tina Lok, uh, was approached at Berlinale by a Russian journalist and uh, she brought the actual original uh, autobiography to me and um, I read it in my broken Russian over a weekend, cried and just felt that I have to turn this into a film. Sergei, do something about it. So I, I felt all almost like unbelievable that how could this story have happened in the 1970s at the height of the Cold War here in Estonia in a Soviet Air Force base and started researching it. Sergei Fetisov published uh, his memoir in Russia in the early 90s at a time when the society was opening up and there was a period of liberal democracy and a kind of hope for the future. He had the courage and, and he wrote about the time that he served as a conscript in the Soviet Air Force in Estonia. I was doing some work in Los Angeles in 2014 and I was kindly introduced to a producer and a film financer who had just actually read Peter's first draft of the script of Firebird. It was most curious because I had been writing different versions of relationships. Then when you know I first read the story, I was like, wow, like this is an incredible backdrop. So she put me in touch with Peter um, at the end of 2014. Who's here? First of all, this was very close to heart for me because I grew up as a closeted gay man in Soviet Estonia. We researched and interviewed quite a few people who did have uh, same-sex relationships in the Soviet army at the time and literally discovered that even at that time in those circumstances people did fall in love, did discover their feelings and did the best that they could under the circumstances of an oppressive regime. Also, it, it kind of began to deal with this place that I've been most interested in, in in writing and in filmmaking, which is this line between friendship and something more. From early on, we made a decision to shoot this film in English, to make it as accessible as widely as possible around the world. We wanted to tell the story with a slight Russian accent, with a kind of feeling of the time and the place. So we started our casting and we received about two and a half thousand self-tapes from actors around the world for the uh, remaining main uh, three roles. We made a promise to look for the best people. 
looked, looked and then go here, not like walking around. So we had a very long search for the casting of our other principal cast, and particularly for the characters of Ramon and Luisa. I met a huge amount of actors during the creative process and, and in auditions, meeting some such talented actors, but they just didn't have the essence of Ramon. We were already at the end of May, a couple of months before the shooting was supposed to start, and getting worried until we were casting one day in Moscow and Oleg walked into the room and I think it was pretty clear also from the first few seconds that this is, this is our Roman. Except for one little thing, he didn't speak any, almost any English. My agent called me and I think, oh, come on, it's going to be English. I don't know English, it's going to be very hard for me, so no, I don't want it. But he said, Oleg, they are waiting for your self-tapes. I say, okay, I'll do it. And when I enter the room, uh, we start our um, casting. Tom tell his line and they like, look at him and I understand that I forget everything. And, and he say, oh, it's fine. And our producer, Brigitte, she speak Russian like, Это ничего, не переживай, Том это играл уже роль, тысяча раз пробовал, он этот текст и на китайский поймет. Then we did it again and again, and Peter just like look at us, and I like it, I like it, and I think like, okay, he think that, uh, okay, boy, uh, you done, uh, you try, bye bye. We just knew this was the closest person that we had found to Roman, and this was really in a way that he held himself in the way that like he looked. We gave him three months to learn English and we actually hired an amazing dialect coach, uh, Catherine Charlton, to work with Tom, Oleg, Tiana and the rest of our key cast. Ivan captures the firebird and she begs for her freedom. He releases, releases, releases. Obviously the most challenging part of it though was that I didn't speak Russian and he barely spoke English. What at first felt like a huge hindrance and a huge challenge and difficulty for us to be able to communicate verbally has ended up in actually a very strong physical connection. It was much more about actions and much less about words. There were no words to describe what these two people are going through, what these three people are going through. Trying to walk that line between friendship and something more when there are no words to describe it in some ways I think has been a real gift between me and Oleg, which meant that we just had to also physically figure it out into going, okay, you can't talk about it, but how is it going to happen? And then really with, with Diana as well, like it was for me one of the first moments that I met her, she really deeply reminded me of somebody significant in my life and, and sort of had this very similar quality. And she also was the absolute epitome of what we'd seen Louisa to be, like in looks, in the way that she spoke, in how she carried herself. I think it's very important to include the female perspective because a lot of same-sex relationship stories, a lot of forbidden love stories just portray the two men or two women getting together and the third party is seen as an obstacle, almost like something to get rid of, to reach happiness. But in real life, they didn't choose to be in that kind of a relationship knowingly, risking everything, risking your career, your family, your life. For Luisa, it's important to find her real men who can make her happy. People in her age, Luisa's age, they already have a family, husband, children. She try and try and, and finally she just asking herself, maybe what's wrong with me? Like, and that's why for women it's very important to feel confident and not to like thinking, what's wrong with me? I think. For me, Luisa's tragedy is at least as big, if not bigger, than Sergei's and Roman's. Elsewhere in the world, Sergei could just go and say, look, I've fallen in love with somebody, 
this amazing fighter pilot, sorry, things didn't work out. I hope you find somebody else. And, and I think they could all live relatively happily ever after. But that's, I think that's the greatest tragedy really of uh, Firebird and of our story set in the Soviet, Soviet Union at the 1970s. The character that I play of Sergei in Firebird, he is a countryside boy who is uh, literally counting down his last days in the military conscription and can't wait to get out of there. He's um, a little bit lost at the beginning of the film and not really knowing what he wants to do with his life. He sort of sees his future as a little bit bleak and not really knowing where it's going. And it's actually through his friendship with Louisa and Volodia that he manages to survive the Air Force Base. And then it is by meeting Roman that he is reminded of his dreams and his passion and what he goes on to follow later in the film. What's interesting to me as an actor to basically show how else would somebody respond to this, not what's the most conventional way to respond, but what else is possible? What else can I potentially show? During the acting process, uh, as a director, he's very good at actually like leaving you alone to do your thing. It's like at what angle if you are facing more the camera? And let's start again improvisation, no words and action. He is uh, uh, in the script, uh, he must be attractive and everything. And I understand that they will do for me cool uh, hairdo, I will have ideal uh, costume, outfit. So I will be perfect in this movie. So I start to run, start to go to the gym and I think, wow, cool, it's a chance for me to be the hero because it's lieutenant. And then I start to discover uh, what lieutenant is it, uh, what uh, soldier is it. Soviet people, they always like ideal people, like they uh, don't drink vodka, uh, they don't have sex, uh, they like, you know, like something more the human that uh, wasn't in real life, they drink vodka and live like I don't know. Then uh, I have uh, some uh, guy who help us with discipline, with all what what is mean. How is uh, Connell uh, talk to lieutenant and lieutenant to Connell? Uh, what is uh, usual to do pilot? And uh, step by step uh, with Peter, with Tom, uh, uh, with Diana, with uh, everybody, we start to build. They help helps me, and you know how say. Uh, Это короля играет Свита. They play me. So, um, if you're ready, I'll just finish here. <laughs> We are ready. <laughs> Major Zverevi roll Firebirdis oli väga nõudlik just selle poolest, et kogu see roll oli vaja sisemiselt läbi tunnetada, sest seal mängida otseselt ei olnud midagi. Et on vaja hüpata või karata või, 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 või sellist erinevaid emotsioone väljand, et sa nuutad või sa rõõmustad väga või midagi sellist olnud vaja teha. Oli vaja olla lihtsalt selline kivinägu ja mõelda, mõelda kogu aeg selle peale, mis, mis see roll on. Ja see tundus alguses küllaltki selline, et kas ma saan hakkama, sest Peeter alguses rõhutas ka seda, et, et vaja on saavutada sellel karakteril selline tulemus, et temast õhkuks sellist jahedus, ohtlikust. Ma olin varem näinud KGB ofitsere oma elus, kui ma olin laps ja see nõukogude režiim oli mulle tegelikult väga hästi teada. Ja ma teadsin ka seda, mida KGB ohvitser justkui pidi tegema, mida ta sees tegelikult tundis, mida ta pidi nii öelda nagu varjama. Ja see võibolla muutiski selle rolli äh, nagu väga huvitavaks minu jaoks. Firebird is based on a true story by Sergei Fetisov and his autobiography, which he published in the 90s in Russia. We really aim to stay as true to the original story as possible, meaning that the love story between the characters is fully as 
he wrote and as he uh, told us. In the process of uh, writing the script, we actually went to Moscow and we interviewed real Sergei. We had an amazing opportunity to spend several days with him and, and did hours and tens of hours of audio recordings and interviews, which really informed me as the director and as a co-writer to get the details right, to get the context right, to understand the characters better. Ну все это я к тому, что вот когда пришло время расставаться, в общем-то, и понимали, что уже, ну, точно знал, что мы так будем, в общем-то, нет, нет, довидеться, да, он сказал, только не оставайся один. Самое страшное для тебя будет, если ты останешься один. When I first met Sergei in Moscow, I was astounded by brightness and love and heart on his sleeve and openness that I decided to take that particularly as an actor and, and put it into the film. But we learn all kinds of fun things from him, you know, what kind of food uh, they would eat on the Air Force Base or you know, what music they were listening to and, and really how his relationship with Roman has stayed with him ever since. It's honestly probably one of the best types of acting preparation you can really ask for. No, and now I ask you, enjoy, drink, eat, come on, come on, sit down and talk to the world, eh? No, for your health, friends! Thank you for Mr. X, sing us your story, eh? How are you? Цветы бросают лепестки на песок. О, ну. Никита Сергеевич, я никогда не пою со столом. Это мой принцип. А что ж нам вот так вот всем выйти из-за столов? Ну, хорошо, товарищ отц. Мы выйдем. Никита Сергеевич, я не могу сегодня пить. Это почему же? У меня отец умирает. What we changed and what we added was really the context, that, or the social context of the time, to also give the feeling of the obstacles to the modern viewer. And secondly, also we really took care to uh, expand Luisa's character and the female perspective in the story to, uh, to talk about her feelings, to show her relationship with Sergei, since the film really starts with the uh, relationship between Sergei and Luisa and also ends with it. I actually honestly had a really hard time just before shooting about the belief in myself, about whether I could do this, whether I could be the lead in a film, whether I could do the service of playing Sergei in real life and leaving his legacy. He passed away a year and a little bit before we started shooting. And I remember we discussed it at length actually about whether we should go to his funeral or not, about if it was appropriate, if we'd known him long enough. And we decided to go to, to Moscow and then take the train out to Oriel, where he had lived and worked for many years. We went to his wake and then there was a very traditional Russian Orthodox burial in a church. And I remember taking that moment and going like, I will do everything I can to the best of my ability to play you in, in truth and in vulnerability and in, in the way you'd like to be remembered. I never have this in my у меня не было этого. У меня есть ощущение, что я прожил ту жизнь, которая мне ну, вот была написана свыше, и я ее жил. Well, it was actually the story of Firebird, which at the time was called Roman when I first read the script, which actually introduced me to Estonia. I'd never been to Estonia before. It's been so fascinating to learn about the history and about the people and about how, you know, the Estonian 
feeling and community has really thrived so much since the collapse of the Soviet Union. And then, you know, to, to shoot in Estonia, where there are many old Soviet environments, obviously, which are kind of crumbling now, but to go and find out these different places, these different sets and shooting in, in East Estonia or around uh, Sompa was just kind of like amazing to be sunk into such authenticity in the locations which are here. You know, there's these peeling walls or there's these particular doors which have like the leather on them like they were from the Soviet time that still exist. I believe that my experience of growing up as a, uh, I think, quite heavily repressed, closeted gay teenager in uh, Soviet Estonia at the time uh, definitely helped to understand the characters and understand the setting. And I definitely used some of these memories from childhood, uh, but even more so, I did a lot of research and uh, actually looked at some of the books. There was an amazing National Geographic book uh, published from 1978 in Estonia. And when you look at those photos, which are made in the city on the streets, not staged, it's amazing how beautiful and how stylish uh, people look. So that's what we really uh, also aim for in our film, to, to give this impression of a more realistic, colorful uh, Soviet world. A lot of films about the uh, Soviet Union have been made in a very stereotypical way. Like in Hollywood, they would grade it bluish, green, they would have all the costumes in grey or black. Don't get me wrong, the system was very oppressive, but people still made the best within it and they enjoyed life and they had parties and they had sex and they had relationships and they wore colourful clothes and they actually took a lot of care to, maybe even more care of how they looked. We wanted the film to be uh, authentic, so we also wanted to shoot all of the exteriors actually on location in Moscow. And we were at first really not sure whether we are able to do that, especially considering the sensitive nature of the forbidden love story. And also likewise that in Russia, I mean, I'd never been to Russia before. And uh, we went there for the first time in May 2016. Having Russian food, experiencing the hospitality of Russian people, like I dearly love the culture of Russia. It was amazing. We had a really, really professional local production partner, and uh, we got access to shoot next to the Kremlin, to shoot in the living districts on rooftops. Uh, literally, pretty much everything that we wished for. The Black Sea scenes we actually shot in Malta. Uh, mostly because our producer said that only over my dead body will I have an intimate scene in Sochi being shot nowadays. Come on. There's nothing quite like breaking the ice of a new set, a new cast and crew together as getting into the Baltic Sea in the beginning of September. I think I spent about 11 hours in the sea that day, which was, I think, about between 10 and 12 degrees. Diana kept on sort of whispering to us and to herself, being like, I love my job, I love my job, I love my job. I had to wait for the water, the surface water, to go completely still, which means just like having to hold my breath and myself underwater in the freezing cold and then kind of like jump up and look like everything's fine. Well, not everything is fine, because obviously there's the nightmare, but certainly not look like I'm freezing cold or beginning to shake. Then we got kindly um, poured with hot water by our costume department. They were literally ladling, like soup ladling hot water onto our bodies to make us warm enough. One of the biggest challenges for me as a director was, of course, recreating the atmosphere and the believability of the Soviet Air Force and Soviet Estonia of the 1970s. We, for example, shot that one of the few last remaining uh, bomb-proof hangars 
of the former Soviet Air Force uh, with a real MiG-21. So we had to literally find the few remaining old crumbling buildings and fix them up. Our construction crews had to fix floors, paint walls, put in electricity. Mavgos, who plays the uh, KGB major, he walked into the room where he tells the, well, where Sergei uh, tells the joke about potatoes and, um, and Mavgos walks into the room and just stands there and, and like, what's, what's going on? And he's, you know, this was the very room where I slept and lived for two years when I was a conscript in the Soviet army. <laughs> Meid viidi hommikul kell kuus ühte sõjave baasi filmima. Ma ei teadnud, kus see on. Ja kui ma oma silmad lahti tegin, siis ma avastasin, et ma olin sattunud täpselt sellesse samasse sõjave baasi, kus ma ise teenisin sõdurina. Ja nüüd siis selle filmi võtteperiood ajal sattusin sinna sellesse sõjave otsa tagasi. Nüüd juba siis nii-öelda KGB majorina. Ja käsutasin ise neid noori sõdureid seal, nii et see oli küllaltki sürrealistlik selline <kõhõh> hommik. The level of like, military accuracy I think that we managed to get within the film was was really, really great. And there were people always on set just going, you know, this is this is accurate, this is not accurate. And then we would take creative liberty with that as well. Sometimes it's a bit like you never wear a hat inside. But we decided, you know, for the sake of this moment, it actually works very well or it completes the aesthetic of the film. So when it came to really honing down the military, the military precision, we we were very much surrounded by people who had been through the Soviet conscription or Soviet army during that time. And that's invaluable to have such a wealth of knowledge in our creative team. One of the big challenges actually in, uh, in filming Firebird was putting on the ballet. Since it wasn't in the repertoire at the Estonian National Ballet, we actually had to ask a favor from the uh, head choreographer, Thomas Edo, who kindly literally staged and choreographed uh, scenes from the ballet, especially for filming. Uh, so they rehearsed for months, we created sets, we created new costumes, uh, lighting design and literally put on a performance of Firebird just to film the scenes for the film. It was an honor and it was humbling to work with some of the top people in the world. Uh, Thomas Edder used to be himself one of the principal dancers of the English National Ballet before moving back to Estonia. Firebird has a lot of meanings in the film. From the plot point, uh, Firebird is an inciting incident in Sergei's life to make changes and, and really take on new challenges. From the other hand, it represents the rebirth and rising from, through the ashes. But uh, on a very pragmatic level, we just love the music. Composing and recording the music score was, was likely one of the highlights of the whole process for me. We made the decision that we want this film to sound like films of the 1970s, when electronic music was really not used, when studio recording of musicians separately was not used. What we decided was to record the full score in one day uh, at the Prague Philharmonic Hall which has amazing acoustics, with a full 85-piece uh, symphony orchestra. And it, it does give a very different result because if you put different groups of musicians in the studio, they just go by the, by the sheet music, and I think the feeling is very sterile. And yes, you can have full control later to mix it together, but it just doesn't sound the same. And I think it also comes across in the film because the expansiveness, the energy of this whole orchestra The 
only thing we added was the piano. We went to Warsaw to record it with one of the uh, kind of stars of uh, Polish classical music scene, Leszek, and I was amazed to observe that process as well because our sound uh, engineer, Rafael, I mean, he's a legend. He recorded most of the Kislovsky films, including one of my all-time favorites, uh, The Blue. I was like blown away that you can record one piano with 13 microphones. To see this level of detail, this level of attention for every note to sound perfect was an inspiration. Music for me as a filmmaker and as an actor is can at times be quite overwhelming and, and very much is part of my inspiration and creative and writing process as well. Um, the music which we put into the film and the link with um, Firebird, Stravinsky's ballet, and then also working with our music composer and, and creating that original score, I think has really aided the emotions which we go after in the film. We had worked with Christoph earlier in the year to make the original score, and he actually then presented one more piece of music which actually was not scored into the film. I went up into the balcony and just watched something being recorded and uh, what I was met with as a musical expression which he had created was just like a recreation of the end of the film. I got so emotional. And um, I actually asked Christopher afterwards, I was like, where is this music from? And he was like, oh, I just, you know, wrote it as an additional piece. Maybe it will go somewhere in the film. And I actually asked him, I was like, please, uh, can we call it if Roman had lived? It is through music that we can even give somebody a new life or give them the life that they never had. So I think it's fair to say the music is pretty important in this film. <laughs> There was very little freedom of speech at the time in the USSR. But what amazed me uh, the most is the extent to which Shakespeare was allowed and publicly performed. Reed Sergei actually used uh, Shakespeare quotes in his uh, memoirs and he started many chapters with a quote from Shakespeare. And yeah, it was 1963. There were 300 different productions of Shakespeare across the Soviet Union. And um, I started reading this book, which was called Shakespeare and the Soviet Union, and, and really about how that was allowed and how it was like a, a way of, of expressing theater and how actually how much influence that had into, into Russia at the time. Why then is none to you? For there is nothing either good or bad, but thinking makes it so. To me, it is a prison. I actually, um went to see the three Chekhov plays at the National Theatre in London uh, when, while we were writing the script. And I was kind of almost pissed off that why have they made it so British? Why have they brought in so much Shakespeare? And then on the way back uh, home was researching and I was amazed to discover how Chekhov was a fan of Shakespeare and how they discovered all of these works outlined and how he really used a lot of uh, a lot of that uh, in his work. So it's interesting to see that the cultures historically have been much more mixed than we uh, nowadays imagine. One thing that really astounded me was how much Sergei was fascinated by Shakespeare. And it was amazing to see that so many parts of the original story, the chapters actually begin with a Shakespeare quote. The writing part of 
Firebird for me came about when Peter and I decided to shoot a teaser uh, for the film. It was through that process that I started making some kind of suggestions on how some of the dialogues just might be tweaked in, in these scenes. And that really led to Peter being very um, gracious to hear my further feedback. You know, I was not a trained writer at this point, but I was just kind of like following an in instinct into like what and how something would sound more realistic. And then we discussed uh, how structurally things could move around and then that literally led us to about two and a half years worth of rewriting together. And then we really kind of like pulled everything back and just go, okay, how are we gonna tell this as truthfully, authentically, and also as, as in so much of an entertaining way as possible. I'm immensely grateful to Peter for having trusted me on so many levels, trusted me to hack away at our script, at the script that he started creating, and that we uh, ended up writing together. And I think I took the film in, and had desire to take the film in a very strong and different direction. And I think that we found a really great, happy medium between the two. I really wanted to make it in this, this much more kind of like thriller, military element, whilst remaining true to the story. So I'm very grateful for Peter's uh, trust in that. There have been times where the sculpting of the story has certainly crossed many different roles. Um, and we have really picked each other up when the going has got tough. That is what I believe is in, is really great creative collaboration, co-collaboration and, and, and really is in the form of such trust. He helped me a lot with my character. He wrote it actually, so this character. It's not like I wrote it and I want you to say this or to feel it. He was always open for me and he asked me all the time in our amazing rehearsals time. How do you feel in this? How do you feel in that? And if I was not sure, then it's, it's not very comfortable. He was ready to change the line. He was ready to listen what I feel. And we were creating different parts of Luisa. As a director, I've always believed that it's really a good idea to not interfere in the first stage of editing. So our editor actually put together the first rough cut by himself. And it was a big challenge uh, editing your first feature film. So after three months after the editor's time ended, we still felt that the film is not quite ready. Once Tumba was having to shoot on a different film, uh, different series, we literally took the edit ourselves and began to do that. And again, that's a very vulnerable place to be in, both as a director and as an actor, and to sit there through and begin to literally co-create, co-edit the film together. It's something that I'm still quite overwhelmed by, the fact that actually to be able to be given that level of trust and input. <laughs> We really sat through the summer and went through each frame of the film and uh, then together with our editor uh, got it to the shape that it is today. For me personally, it's really important if this film manages to create a little bit more of uh, understanding, of empathy. Maybe for people especially who don't have a personal experience, who don't have a friend or a family member uh, who is in a same-sex relationship, for them to understand it better and to really see and to feel that love is love, that it's not in any way different from the way they love somebody. Sergei was a example of courage, of following his heart in dire circumstances and kept on going, kept on believing in himself and in the relationship which he was having with Ramon. I'd love people to take away the truth of the relationship and that it happened in such an environment because it's so unusual. And I think that not many audiences have seen such a true love story based in such a active, rigorous and unexpected environment before. I believe that 
like Beta does, that film is one of the most impactful ways to, dare I say, change the world or to change perceptions. And I think that that's really beautiful to have seen that that's what's emerged. I hope some people could understand better the love between same-sex couples that might be something fearful or unfamiliar before. And one of the most amazing experiences for me as a filmmaker has been seeing the film with an audience. The overall response to the film, for the most part, has been quite overwhelming in a really positive way. It's been so beautiful to screen the film at uh, different LGBT festivals and to really give something to the community, to the people whose story we are telling. I've been really moved to receive messages from many different people sharing very deeply information about their own personal lives, explaining their current living circumstances and saying that the film has given them hope the film has given them an escape. The film has given them courage to love a little bit more authentically or to see a representation of themselves in some shape or form that makes them feel like it's okay to be who they are. That kind of defies words or description really, but it's more of a feeling to like, go, I see you. Clearly we have a core LGBT uh, audience since this one of the really rare stories of the community and a very unique story from the time and place which has rarely been told before. But from the other hand, it's a very universal story and a lot of uh, normal cinema goers, a lot of uh, younger and older married couples, boyfriend, girlfriends with popcorn found a message in the film, found that it touches them. People look at this not like, you know, we make movie for some group of people. No, this movie for everybody who know what love is. It was amazing to see how the film was received in Tallinn, in Estonia, and um, how much the story has really impacted people and how astounded people are by the size of the film that we created. After our world premiere in Tallinn, it was also amazing to see the five-minute ovation by the audience. It's been amazing to also see so many straight people, so many women come to me after the screenings and in tears telling, sharing how this film was so relatable to them, how it brought out their memories of how their husband in the past uh, cheated with another woman, for example. And the universality of this uh, love story, uh, the relatability is, is something that I really cherish. So it is through those public demonstrations which feel authentic and true that gives permission for other people to do the same thing. It can feel very overwhelming at times to be able to change these subject matters in the world but we can really own them by being that example, by experiencing art that inspires us to be a greater version of ourselves, a more free version of ourselves. I believe it is our divine right to love whoever we love, and who on earth is it to say that that's not okay? Yeah.